Good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, this hour we will be hearing from John Wachter about the Redfield Horde. And John, you can go ahead and turn on your camera and microphone. Uh, it should be in the same place as you found it last time. There we go. Uh, so John is a graduate of the Naval Academy and was also a Naval officer. Uh, he's been a collector since 2000 and has specialized in Morgan dollars, as I'm guessing we could all imply from the subject of his presentation. Uh, so audience members, we will be doing a short Q&A at the end. So if at any point you would like to, you are welcome to send in questions with that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, otherwise, John, you may take it away. Okay, um, I want to thank you, Leanna, who I've been working with, and the NNP for giving me this opportunity. Um, one of my passions. Um, a little background, um, like I said, I've been collecting Morgans seriously since about 2000. Um, and I discovered the red fields. Uh, one of my subsets of collecting is, is nicely toned Morgan dollars, nicely colorful Morgans. And I, I started seeing all these red field slabs when I was on eBay looking for toned Morgans. And I dug a little deeper into the story. And it's a very fascinating story, uh, not only for collectors, but I think non-collectors will get a kick out of it too. Uh, the man's name is LaBera Redfield. That's a picture of him in the middle. Um, he's kind of short and slight. I'm only 5'6", so short is a relative term, but he's about my height. And as you'll hear more in, in the presentation, um, although a very wealthy man, he was pretty much uh, seen in flannel shirts and jeans a lot of the time and we'll talk some more about that okay um about the man not a lot is known uh directly uh he just was you know a guy uh there's a lot of fact and a lot of legend uh, we'll kind of try and separate the two as we go through it uh we do know he was born in ogden utah in 1897 uh he moved to uh, idaho prior to his 20s and started a lot of uh, lower level jobs there. He dug potatoes. Uh, he worked in a department store and eventually became the manager. And that's where he met his wife, Nell, and we'll hear more about her as we go along. <clears throat> then in 1929, he moved to Los Angeles, uh, became a stockbroker, stock trader, and evidently uh, had the magic touch. Uh, even through the depression, he made quite a, um, bit of his first fortune in oil and mining stocks and he started his dabbling in real estate and you'll hear real estate was kind of his real passion. Uh, he and his wife moved to Reno in 1935 and that's when he uh, really started aggressively buying uh, raw land around Reno and in Washoe County. Uh, he owned about 80 square miles of Washoe County and 51,000 acres of raw forest. Uh, outside the Reno area, and he held on to that uh, pretty tightly. Uh, this is Redfield's house in Reno. Uh, it's going to have a part in the story. Uh, he didn't have it built. And he bought it about third hand. It was built in 1932. Uh, it's made of um, what they call river stone, taken from some of the areas around Reno. And what's of note about this, and it's not in the picture, which has a part in the story, is on the far side of the house that you can't see. There's a driveway. This, this house is built on a, on a hill, on a little hill going down to street level. And there's a driveway on the far side and also down in the front uh, underneath what you see there is a two car garage at street level, which uh, held part of his hoard as you'll hear about. Now Redfield, uh, he distrusted banks. He hated the government. He hated income tax. Uh, now, he had to deal with banks quite a bit because of his uh, land investments and other things. So he got to know them, and it plays a part in how he got uh, uh, he gathered up his dollars. Um, his hoarding of, of dollars was known uh, reasonably well. He was the victim of two major robberies uh, in 1952. Uh, they called it the boudoir burglary because uh, it was broken into a safe in his bedroom closet. Not a good place to hide your safe, by the way. Uh, they took about $3 million in cash, uh, stock and bond certificates, as well as some jewelry he was holding for, for 
a female friend of his who was suspected of being one of his paramours, and we'll talk a little bit about that later too. Uh, oddly enough, they got most of that, that back. And then in 1961, uh, his house got broken into again while he and his wife were out. Uh, they never confirmed the total amount that was taken, but uh, suspected uh, speculation, he lost one to two million dollars worth of some of his silver and some other things that he had hidden in the house, uh, did not get that back. Uh, one thing I didn't put in this slide, and it also has a bearing, uh, he was a victim of a pretty brutal mugging in 1948, uh, was pretty severely beaten around the head and body. And it, uh, in later years, Nell, his wife, had said that that kind of was the beginning of his hoarding and uh, more reclusive behavior, although he wasn't really a recluse in the sense of Howard Hughes or anything like that. Uh, he was convicted of tax evasion in 1960. Uh, he defended himself, obviously not very well. Uh, he was sentenced to five years and served 18 months of that at Terminal Island uh, up there in the Los Angeles area. And in classic Redfield fashion, uh, he bragged about the fact that he got a free gallbladder operation off the government while he was incarcerated. Uh, he then died in 1974 of a heart attack and had an estate uh, worth about, well, go over $200 million at the time. Like I said, hearsay and legend, um, he was supposedly generous to his family and his very small, very close circle of friends, but he was uh, notoriously cheap, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, I described his clothing. He very rarely was seen unless he was wearing flannel shirts, old beat up jeans, boots. Uh, he drove an old pickup truck, which uh, he used uh, to gather his coins among other things. And he was allegedly, allegedly a very lousy tipper, particularly in his gambling endeavors. Uh, high stakes roulette was his game of choice. And he obviously claimed to have had a, a system which really wasn't true. He probably lost more than he won, uh, but that was his one true extravagance uh, of, his, uh, of his money. He did play other games, but he was noted for high stakes roulette. He was not a recluse in what we would think as the term, you know, the term, the Howard Hughes type thing. He oddly enough bears kind of a resemblance to the older Howard Hughes. He wasn't a crazy old coot. Uh, he was known in the, Re in the Reno area. He was often seen walking around. Um, he didn't drive that much. He walked uh, from his house to downtown Reno, or he'd take the bus. And like I said, he was seen gambling quite a bit in several clubs in Reno. Uh, unfortunately, he was rumored to have had a number of uh, affairs during his marriage, but he did remain married to Nell uh, up until his death in uh, 1974. Nell, by a uh, different, died in 1981. <clears throat> Now we'll talk about the hoard itself. Uh, Redfield was by no uh, stretch of the imagination a collector of coins. Um, like I said, he had earlier on, he had to deal with banks and he would go around and uh, to several banks he worked with and would buy the thousand coin uh, bag, bags of silver dollars, which were available freely at the time, obviously in use in the casinos, and he'd buy them at face value. Uh, one interesting story, you know, one of those legend things <clears throat> is he went to one of his banker friends uh, to get several bags and the, the banker was going to charge him a small fee for the guys that had to haul the bags up uh, and throw them in his truck. Um, he refused to pay the fee, said, take them back. I don't want them. So classic uh, Redfield thriftiness, if you will. <clears throat> he may have had some idea of better dates of Morgan dollars. Uh, there's a lot of argument back and forth. Uh, he was known to have sold some of his bags. And uh, some people say he knew some of the better dates and would pick them out uh, and replace them with lessers. Uh, as I mentioned, he'd load his truck up and then jump, drive him up that driveway I mentioned and drop him down in the coal chute to his basement. Uh, those of us that grew up in the Midwest and East and older houses 
probably had a coal shoot. I knew I, we had a coal boat been in a shoot in my house that I grew up in. Um, he also built false walls in his garage that I talked about down below his house and stored some of his bags there. Uh, he was believed at one time that he had over 600 1,000 coin bags of $600,000 of Redfield of, of silver dollars. He may have sold some. Some were probably taken in the 1961 robbery. Uh, at final count, when his estate was being settled, interesting thing about his estate being settled, uh, the IRS came in. You know, he hated the IRS. He left a note. Uh, to his wife saying, don't tell him about the silver dollars. And of course, the IRS was the one that found the letters. Um, a final count, 407,596 coins. There was almost 400 complete full bags of the dollars, plus what we'll call shovelfuls of loose coins. And that that is literal. When they were cleaning out the basement, you know, some of the bags burst when they went into the basement and people were just shoveling them, get them out of the way and obviously banged up uh, quite a few of them and didn't uh, come out in very nice condition. It was a mixture of, of peace and Morgan dollars, predominantly Morgans, uh, a small amount of the seated Liberty dollars. Uh, there was never a complete and accurate listing compiled, uh, at least nothing that was made public. Uh, 350,000 plus were evaluated as uncirculated. And those conditions go from pretty scraped up shoveled ones up to the higher MS uh, mint state levels. Uh, it was mostly common estimate Morgans and Peace dollars. Uh, there were some better date Carson City dollars and the elusive 1893 S dollar. Uh, roughly 43 different dates and mint marks. Uh, the total weight of the whole hoard was over 10 tons. Uh, they had numerous armored cars hauling that stuff away when they decided to settle as a state. <clears throat> How did they get distributed? Um, after a lot of back and forth on his estate, there were several wills being argued over whether they were valid or not. But once it was settled, uh, a courtroom auction was called. Um, it was more or less a blind auction. Uh, the bidders who were offered the auction knew that there were only that there were about 400,000 plus coins. There were no real breakdown of dates. Uh, I understand that some of them, uh, specifically Mark, Steve Markoff, who we'll talk about in a minute, as well as uh, Q. David Bowers firms, Bowers and Ruddy might have been able to see some of them. Uh, but to my knowledge, there was no complete accurate listing of what was in the hoard. Um, Q. David's firm bid $7.2 million for the whole shebang. Um, but the winning bidder was a man named Steve Markoff and his company, A Mark Coin, bid $7.3 million, average of $18 per coin. Now, Markov split those coins up between two other dealers and a subdivision of his firm, A Mark, called Paramount International Coin Corporation, which, uh, as we'll see, is one of the is probably the best known of the distributor uh, of the of the hoard. And Paramount got the majority, and they're best known because of the ultrasonic slabbing, which we'll see and talk about if you haven't seen them. And you know, we have slabbing companies galore. You know, the three big ones, PCGS, MGC, and ANAX now, and other ones out there. Uh, and it wasn't particularly new technology then, since the GSA sales of the uh, Carson City dollars and others, which is a whole other subject, uh, were going on at the same time with sonic sealed slabs. Um, when this was being marketed, there was a big fear that the coin market was going to crash again. Uh, we saw that in the early 60s when they started discovering all these hidden bags of Morgan dollars and previous rarities became very common. But Markov and his group were very clever in the marketing of it and the distribution. It wasn't all dumped on the market at once. Uh, and it was, they were sold uh, very well. And it did not, as a matter of fact, it probably enhanced uh, collectors' desires to get their hands on 
silver dollars, coins in general, as well as the specific uh, uh, Redfield hoard. Now, what you see in front of you now are three types of the slabs that the Paramount Coin Company uh, Corporation used to sell their hoards. Uh, they broke them down into three uh, grades, 60, 65, and 65 plus. And like I said, this was in the days before uh, the grading companies. On the left, the ones graded MS-60 uh, are in a black slab. Um, some of them are pretty rough. Um, a lot of them got significantly toned, as we'll see in one of my future slides. Uh, not so much because they sat in Redfield's basement, but because of the sulfur in the paper in the slabs. Um, in the middle is an example of the 65. They graded them as 65. They're in a red slab. Those, in my opinion, are the most common. Uh, you'll see them on eBay a lot, and if people have them, uh, those are the ones you'll see most often. The rarest, and I think I've seen one in, in my time at, at a coin show, the 65 plus are in a Kelly green holder, very dark green, which obviously you can't make out very well in this picture. Um, and I think a lot of them probably got cracked out and sent in back in the day. And we'll talk about that in a second too. <clears throat> Other red fields you might see. Um, here's an example of NGC and PCGS slabs. Um, as I mentioned back in the day, uh, the better ones would get cracked out of their sonic slab and sent into the grading companies. They'd get the provenance, uh, but uh, not necessarily, like I said, the authentic in the holder red fields. And now NGC will grade them uh, in their original slab. Uh, if you talk to them, they grade them under the, they do the same thing with the GSA slabs now. And that's kind of what it looks like, what you would get back from them. Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, one that's in a, in a outside holder like an NGC or a PCGS uh, doesn't hold the premium uh, or the ambiance, if you will, uh, of one that's actually still in the holder, uh, particularly one that might be graded. And as you see there, the one in the red slab is greater than MS-63. Most of the 65 graded ones that I've seen came out in the 62, 63 range, maybe a couple higher. And I, got, I don't know if PCGS or, or ANAX or any of the other companies actually grade red fields in the slab. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, you can call NGC and, and work it out with them if you want, if you have any of these. <clears throat> this is not a red field dollar. In my opinion, uh, you will see these offered as red fields. Uh, if you look at the slab closely, it's the same Paramount International Coin Corporation, but the wording's different. It does not say a red field collection. Uh, and once again, in my opinion, uh, they do not deserve uh, the premium that's being asked of a quote unquote genuine uh, red field dollar. In the in the red field annotated holder, uh, so proceed with caution if you will. These are my red fields. Um, I used to have several of them. I sold most of them. I held on to a couple of these. Um, I particularly like this one in the black slab, uh, the upper left hand corner. Uh, it's an 81s, and um, this picture doesn't do justice to the toning. It's a I, mean, they, I love that word iridescent. It's an iridescent, very bright, shiny blue that shows off the dollar. It's only one of the MS-60 slabs, but it's uh, it's just it's the, one of the pride of my toned Morgan collection. Uh, the one on the right is a 78S. It's pretty beat up, but I kept it because I haven't seen uh, too many uh, 78S uh, red fields. I'm sure they're out there. I just you see mainly 82, 83, 84, 81S uh, ones for sale. And then I kept one, the, the best of my red slab ones for my collection. Okay. Um, whoops. I am going to show you now. There are, 
I got the most of my background on this uh, from a particular book called the, the, the Curious Life of Nevada's Libera Redfield and Silver Dollar King. It's not a very big book, has an incredible amount of information uh, by Jack uh, Harpster. Uh, I, it's out of print, I think. I actually got this copy on eBay uh, some time ago. And I also used um, John Highfield's uh, noted tome on uh, uh, the Encyclopedia of Silver Dollars, which is about yay thick and has a lot of good information. Uh, so that uh, pretty much sums up uh, what I've got. I want to give a shout out to my, I, I'm calling, I'm on here from Tula Vista, California, a suburb of San Diego. I want to shout out to my San Diego area coin club people that might be watching as well as classmate friends and family that I tried to console to watch my 15 minutes of fame. So um, thank you all for, and I'm standing by to have anything that I might be able to help you with. Oh, I want to do one more shout out too. If you are interested in buying some red fields and getting some red fields, they're all over eBay. I'm going to do another shout out to a friend of mine named Daniel Malone, Portsmouth, Ohio, runs Portsmouth Coin Company, PortsmouthCoinCompany.com. He's bought into a pretty large hoard of these, uh, sent several of them in for grading, and you might check with him if you're interested in buying. Uh, shout out, Daniel, you owe me a discount. Okay, thanks, Leanna. All righty, then we're going to do some Q&A. Um, so audience members, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can just click on that and send us in some questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, it looks like we have one. Um, I found a Redfield Horde 1964 JFK half in a holder. Have you seen these before? No. Uh, the Redfield... <laughs> It wouldn't be a red field. Like I said, red field died in 74. Um, it, I don't know why there would be a JFK uh, in a red field holder. It should not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, cut and dry there. Um, what is the highest graded TPG certified red field piece you've seen? 65, I think, was the highest grade I've seen on anything, either cracked out or graded in the slab. Uh, there may be higher ones out there. Those are the only ones I've seen. Um, and like I said, I, you, 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 I, and I would see them at shows. I didn't see them online or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, more specific variation on that one. What was the highest graded 93S? I don't think we know. I obviously, I haven't seen one. I, I would love to have one. I don't know how many there were in the hoard, uh, and I don't know if they stayed in, in any holder. Uh, I can't answer that. I don't know. Uh, is there a reference on the date breakdown of the coins slabbed? Uh, yeah, the two things I mentioned, oh, the coins slabbed, uh, that you would probably have to go to, to NGC's website uh, to check theirs. Um, I, to my knowledge, they've got a rough idea of the total count of, of breakdown of dates and mint marks in this book I showed, as well as some other resources online and John Highfield's book. It's not definitive. Um, I can't tell you how many have been cracked out or, or you know, regraded, graded, and provenanced. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. Uh, let's see, if you have Morgans not in the original case or with a pedigree on the slab, can you tell if they may have been a Redfield piece? I would say no. Um, there's, there's no way to track it down. Uh, there's no, there were no particular distinctive markings. As I mentioned, a lot of them a lot of them had, especially the ones that kind of blew up in the basement that were, you know, the shovelfuls, uh, had some, some um, pretty modeled toning. I didn't mention. I should have mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the, in the show. Um, I mentioned that Redfield got mugged, and his wife had said he had begun hoarding, uh, kind of after that, and maybe something got rewired in his brain. Uh, he also hoarded food, canned food. Um, he was known to go and buy 
cans that where the label came off. So he didn't know what he was buying. He just knew he was getting the deal. It's kind of like my dad. He never saw a sale he, that he could pass up. But he'd buy a lot of that. Uh, he hoarded alcohol, too. And it was he was a teetotaler. Or if he did drink, very, very little. But he started hoarding alcohol as well. And the, one of the other legends is all these cans of fruit started blowing up in his basement and, and stained some of the dollars. So they got toned and modeled and all. But back to the original question, uh, I would say no. There's no way unless there's some kind of unless you've got a piece of paper or a pedigree to go with it. Uh, why are the grades so low if they were from original bags? You, uh, if the history of dollars uh, is that a lot of the bags got moved around a lot. Uh, even the ones where you get the GSAs and the ones that, you know, the way Morgan dollars work is they started minting them in 1878 uh, under a an act, the Grand Allison Act, which made the country buy X million tons of silver to make dollars, and nobody wanted them, except you know for some states in the West. So these bags would get made and then thrown in vaults, whether in in the mint or they would get in it and they would go back and forth to banks and stuff, never open. And when you're throwing something that big and heavy around and a thousand of them in a bag, they get beat up pretty bad. Uh, now, obviously, there are others, but like I said, he'd buy these bags, throw them in his basement, and, yeah, they, and you're talking 600 bags keep piling onto each other. There's bound to be, you know, nicks and bangs and stuff. Now, like I said, I don't necessarily know what, how many have certified higher. I've seen 65s, uh, and I don't, but it's something that I don't, I don't know, but that's, that's how dollars got banged up, and that's how a lot of Morgans these days um, didn't circulate. They got thrown around and banged around in, in treasury vaults and bank vaults. And there you have it. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. What is the estimated value of an average Redfield? Uh, I haven't looked lately. Uh, if you go on like on eBay, you will, you will see, you'll see a red slab common date like an 80, 80S, 81S, 82S, I want to say probably in the $120, $130 range off. Uh, that's kind of what I paid. There's no real price guide for them. They're like, you know, the, the, the gray sheet does do GSAs, for example, now. Mm -hmm. in the, but uh, there's no real grade for them. My advice to be, would be to look around. And as I mentioned, my, my friend Daniel Malone, uh, he's got a good eye for them and could probably give you an idea, but I would say the real common dates and the red slab, you're, you're going to see them offered probably $120, $130 a piece. And make sure you get the one that says Redfield Collection on it. <laughs> uh, is there a club or group that specializes in the Redfield coins? I wish there was, not that I know of. You should start one. There you go. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, how much of a price difference is there between pieces slabbed in new holders, graded in original holders, and ungraded? Uh, I can't answer that definitively. Uh, I, I think if someone was quote unquote less reputable, <laughs> he would try, he or she would try to sell, say, an NGC slabbed red field in the same condition and the same for the same price as maybe one that's in the original slab. As I mentioned, my personal opinion, if it's not in the original Redfield slab, it doesn't deserve, to me, it's just another silver dollar. If you've got an ADS, an MS-63 Redfield, and an ADS that looks pretty nice in a Redfield slab, the, the Redfield slab is going to get the premium and you should pay whatever 63 money is for the one that's in a regular red, you know, in an NGC, a cracked out slab, I'll call it. Right. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I would, and I would, and I would, I haven't bought, and I don't, I haven't seen a lot. They're coming in more now, the graded in slab ones from NGC, they're becoming a lot more popular and they will probably get a higher premium just because the grade is going to be verified. 
uh, and authenticated as opposed to something that may have gotten by somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you consider a complete Redfield collection? Ooh. That's a tough. I mean, like I said, you, 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 I would have to go back and look at the list of what they know. Um, I saw one guy years ago when they originally sold the Redfields when Paramount originally, if you bought a bunch of them, they came in a really, really nice wooden box. And there was probably like 10 or 11, 10 or so in the box. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can't answer that because I'd have to, I, number one, I don't think you could do it. Um, like I said, there's a lot of the, you know, they might say, oh, there was a 93 S somewhere in the group way I go good luck finding it um <laughs> if I were if I were someone that was interested in buying and you know red fields just for the it, it, it's it's a it's a piece of history and it's a really really neat story um I would and you can do it quote unquote cheaply by going for some of the common dates the 80 the 81 the 80s 81s 82s and you'll see a lot of those uh to build an honest to god full collection uh, you're talking big bucks, and I don't I honestly don't know how you would do it. Uh, in the 1961 robbery, you mentioned about a million dollars was taken. Do you have any idea how much of that was in dollar coins? No, they they never, uh, neither Redfield nor the police, I'm kind of going through my notes here real quick, came out with what was taken specifically in that robbery. Like I said, the one to two million was kind of a speculation. Now, it depends. They, they know that they got some of the bags because the, the, the walls in the garage and stuff were, were, were tampered with. Uh, but they don't, nobody, I don't think anybody accurately knew how many, or if they did, they didn't tell. All right. Uh, did he just save Morgan dollars or did he also save peace dollars? He, he didn't save Morgan, like I said, he wasn't a collector. He didn't save Morgan dollars per se. He bought bags of silver dollars. And whether they were same date or not, yes, there were peace dollars in the collect in the bags. Uh, there were some seated liberty dollars in the bags. There are you will see peace dollars offered in the Redfield slabs, not nearly as common uh, as as the mortgage. And like I said, he was he was in Reno. He was he was in the Western Bank. Most of the stuff he had was was S Mint Morgans, common date S Mint Morgans, some Carson Cities. Um, some of the better date Carson cities, if you will, the 92, 93s, not a lot. Most of it was S mint. Um, so. All righty. Uh, what was the single most common date among the horde? I'd have to go look. I didn't get that down, but once again, 80, 80, 81, 82 S were the ones that were the most common in general. I, I can't break it down into which one specifically, but those those particular, I could if I went back and looked in the book, but that, and like I said, nobody really knew the total breakdown of mints and dates, but those are the ones that, that, that they knew were there most of them. That's the ones you'll see most commonly um, in the offerings. Now there, there you also see there's a lot of, of, every now and then you'll get some Philadelphia dollars and be thrown in there. Mm -hmm. that he got in his bags but yeah mostly most common and the ones you could probably find easiest if you wanted a slab in your collection 80 81 82 s all righty uh how many years was he actively adding to his hoard well let me do the mental math <laughs> um his why let's let's say i'm going to say about 25 years uh it kind of went from when he was mugged in 48 up until the time he died um, in, in 1974. So that's the ballpark of 25 years. And um, yeah, he just, when it, when the spirit moved him, if you will, he'd drive his truck down to the bank and throw a couple bags in the back. <laughs> uh, what got you interested in Morgan's originally? I'm like, well, I, well I, my first Morgan, when I was, I, I'm like a lot of people, when I was a kid, you know, and an early teenager, uh, I, my father was a banker and he'd bring home, not silver dollars, but he'd bring home stuff, you know, we'd put pennies in folders. He was, he was calling for silver. 
and we joined the local coin club. Hello, Chillicothe Coin Club in Ohio, if you're on board. Um, and I won a 1904 dollar in a, in a raffle when I was what 13 years old or something, which I still have. And I always said uh, after that, I was always fascinated by that dollar. It was beautiful, and I said someday I'm going to start collecting Morgans. And then back in about 2000. I was in one of my last tours in the Navy and I was on shore duty and I said, I'm going to start getting back into this. I actually started buying GSA dollars first, but it was just that, that, that one example that I got as a kid that came back to haunt me, if you will, and cost me how much, <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're, they're an incredibly, you know, beautiful set. I would recommend people if they're ever interested in doing Morgans, the first thing I did was to build a date set go out and get a dance go date set and other than the 93 94 95 which are all expensive uh they're pretty you could be pretty easy to fill a book uh did the redfield horde popularize silver dollar collecting yes it did very much from what i from everything i read and I, as i mentioned uh they were worried oh my god we're gonna we're gonna crash the market dumping all these dollars uh into the public but uh, sort of like the state quarter thing. All of a sudden, people started hearing about this hoard, and that's what makes it kind of fascinating to non-collectors, uh, as well as oh my God, this guy had four hundred thousand silver dollars. What a, what a nutcase! Oh, by the way, I want one of them. And yes, it did. It did, uh, to, by all accounts, popularize not only silver dollars but but coin collecting in general. Particularly, you know, if we heard after nineteen the nineteen sixties when all these bags of previously rare dollars came out and the GSA sales, uh, these coins that were never popular in circulation, you know, people would get them for Christmas presents and stuff. But other than that, that's, it really, I think, spurred at the time, uh, more aggressive collecting and just in dollars in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, after he died, did the family keep any of the dollars? Oh, I, I didn't touch on that. I should have. Um, as I mentioned, Redfield himself was not known to be particularly generous. His wife, on the other hand, now after his death, um, he did, I, the family didn't keep any. They they got rid. You know, she got rid of the hoard. You know, through Markoff and those guys, and she established the Nell Redfield Foundation charitable foundation, uh, which is known to this day in the Reno area. They, they gave quite a bit of money to the University of Nevada at Reno and a lot of local area um, charities and stuff like that. And Nell was very charitable and she, she gave uh, LaVera's money away very well. <laughs> uh, how often do Redfield pieces come up for sale and where's the best place to find them? The easiest place to find them is on eBay. You'll always find them on eBay. Um, I don't know too many particular, in, in my experience with dealers, they might have one or two if you walk, do a walk into a dealer. Uh, easiest thing would be Google it, you know, look for, uh, like I said, I, I bought all mine uh, through eBay back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, I mentioned my friend in, in Portsmouth Coin Company .com, who's going to be selling a bunch of them. He, he bought a pretty big gaggle of them. But I think if you Google it and, and look at dealers, you'll find them. But at the most common place uh, you'll see them is on eBay. Uh, which was your first Redfield? Whew, I don't think I still have it. Uh, it was probably, oh, I know which one it was. It was an 1896 P. It was one of that, and I don't know why I bought that. I got it off of eBay back when I was early on, and it wasn't it wasn't like it was toned or anything that really caught my eye. Uh, but it was a red field, and it, I remember I, I think I paid I don't know 85, 90 bucks for it at the time. But yeah, that was that was my first. And second part of that question, um, and which was the most expensive? I didn't buy any terribly expensive ones. I probably paid the 120 to 130 range for a couple of them. As a matter of fact, that 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 81S, the one I showed, the toned one, I got for a pretty good deal because it was in a 60 slab and nobody wanted it, and I just loved it. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, the prices the prices have gone up on eBay since I was dabbling, for example. Uh, but yeah, they just you know caveat emptor and make sure you're you're getting the real deal and if you wanted to do it. Uh, how are I you? Didn't have, I didn't have any of the nice rare ones or green slab ones or any of them that would be like, oh my god, I got to pay. Now I did with the GSAs, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how are the first? How are the coins first sold or distributed? Uh, when Markov bought the lot, and like I said, yeah, there are pictures of these Brinks trucks just pulling away from the Redfield garage. Um, Markov split it up there, and I can't recall the names, but he had a couple of other dealers that he sold some of the hoard to, and then he took uh, his biggest hunk and gave them to this Paramount International Coin Corporation. I believe it was in Ohio. Um, and that's when they started. And this was in, like I said, what, 76? I think I said in the auction. And then they started um, offering, they were, they were mail, mail sales. Uh, it wasn't bid, but I wish I had pictures of it. There were, you know, ads in coin magazines and coin world and stuff um, were advertised selling these. Uh, mainly through Paramount Coin Corporation. To my knowledge, the ones that went to other dealers, they they weren't slabbed. There was maybe a little certificate or some kind of a um, provenance attached to them. Um, I've only seen pictures of those. I haven't seen any offered actually, other than you know, hey, maybe it was offered in a Redfield slab or something like that. But the big thing that Markov did, like I said, is he didn't try to slab them, dump them all out at once. He offered them slowly via, you know, there was no internet back in the day. He did it slowly by mail bid and by, you know, by advertising and through several years managed to do very well on it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Okay, we got a longer one here. Uh, you mentioned that Paramount released these pieces strategically into the marketplace as they were concerned about depressing the market. That seems to be a very kind interpretation, as we have to assume that Paramount wanted to maximize their profits. Sure. Not to suggest that this was unique on their part, as there are many examples of other dealers drip feeding hordes into the marketplace to keep prices high. Given this, my question is, do you think that once all the Redfield pieces were eventually released, do you feel that the early purchasers, purchasers got value for money, or was there a dip in price in the end once they were all finally out there? Good question. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to speculate, and this is not based in any real fact, but it's a sine wave, I think. I think, um, I kind of saw the same thing. If anybody is familiar with the Binion Horde, which came out several years ago, Teddy Binion, the casino mogul in Vegas, hoarded a bunch of silver, and it got um, sold uh, most of them were slapped. I think all of them were slapped through NGC. The, the dollars were sold by a company. And they never got to the premium or the interest, in my opinion, that the Redfields did. Uh, I would suspect, I'm sure, that when the Redfields were originally offered, they weren't offered for like 120, 130 bucks. Uh, if you got one back in 76, 77, um, you're probably sitting, and you still have it, you're probably sitting on a pretty tidy profit on that. Uh, like I said, just in the last 10, 15 years that I've watched it, the prices have slowly crept up. So, mm -hmm. it, and it wasn't, and, and I, there may have been some, and it might not just have been because of the Redfield board, you know, depression of, of, of prices and coins and stuff over the years, um, you know, the market cycle. Um, long, long answer to a question. Uh, I, I don't know that it necessarily caused any real great profit or loss. Um, I know that if you bought one back in the day and you still got it or you sold it recently, you came out ahead. So hope that helps you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think that some of the dollars have still not been released? I can't imagine them not being, not being, I don't even think, um, I don't think the Paramount Coin Corporation is in existence anymore. I know, I'm not sure. Um, 
there might be some, like I said, that are closely held, but I think I think they're probably all out. And I think a lot, like I said, I think a lot of them got cracked out once the grading services came online. There's probably a lot of them out there that have no provenance whatsoever. They just probably got sent in. Um, but I would imagine that, yeah, there's no hidden stash by some dealer anywhere, some company waiting to release these things. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's possible that the Redfield holders with grades inspired modern third party grading services? I don't think Redfield in and of itself, uh, based on what I know about how the, the grading services got established. Um, a lot of it was was David Hall, TCGS, and his cohort sitting around saying, we've got to figure out something here. You know, and the ongoing saga and complaint about coin grading back in the day and whatnot. Um, I believe that the both the Redfield and the, the GSA sales, for example, probably added some interest slash validity to the idea. But the idea of standing up the grading services, I think, goes more towards, like I said, uh, I can't remember the guy that originally started the one company, but I know David Hall uh, when he was doing PCGS and they tell us about, hey, we got to do something about this. Let's try this. And if you, you know, if you collectors, if you remember the old original PCGS slabs that were, you know, the rattlers that are just real easy to pop open and mm -hmm. up to what we have these days. So no, short answer, no, I don't think the Redfield GSA slabs caused the grading services, but I'm sure they probably promoted some interest. All right, it looks like that is all that we have in here right now. Um, so yeah. anyone else who has questions, go ahead and get them in promptly. Um, in the meantime, John, did you have any closing words that you would like to share? Uh, like I said, I want to thank you, Leanna, and the folks at NMP for giving me this opportunity. I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing this. Uh, and thank everybody for tuning in. Thanks for the great questions. I was, I didn't know. And I hopefully get the word out uh, to your non-collector friends. When these go up online, you can watch it and watch a very interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, good luck. And don't buy those non-Redfield slabs. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, John. Um, and a reminder to everyone in the audience, like you mentioned, all of these are being recorded. Uh, they'll be up on the NNP about two weeks after the symposium is over, so from today. Um, and you'll be getting an email when those are up. If you have not been getting our emails thus far, um, just check back on the symposium website around then, and there will be links all over the place to them. And you're welcome to share those wide and far um, to get some more people into numismatics. So uh, that will wrap us up. Uh, audience members, we do have some more, there's a hand raised in the audience and I'm not sure what to do. Oh, it went down, okay. Um, we do have a few more presentations left today. There are two starting at five o'clock. We've got James Glickman with Collecting American Colonials 101, um, as well as Kyle Anderson, who will be talking about some Disney dollars. So we've got some interesting things coming up. Um, let's see. Um, and yes, anyone in the Q&A, um, if you would like to contact either us at the NMP Symposium or John, you can use that Contact Us tab on the Symposium website, um, and we will forward it along to the appropriate parties. So that is a way to get in touch with us. Um, so I believe that will wrap us up. Uh, thank you, everyone, and hope to see you all back at some of our final three presentations for the weekend. And beat Army. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.